Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the webinar so of Marshall's Global video. Compounders Portfolio. Um, we are good, right? Everybody can hear me, Pooja? Pooja, we are live? Okay. Yeah. Yes, Priyashri, we can hear you. Okay, so hi, everyone. Good evening again. Uh, my name is Riyashri Mukherjee, and I'm a part of the client advisory and relationship team at Marshallis. As you all can see, we have a very special guest today in the webinar, uh, Dr. Anup Ramani. Let me quickly introduce him to all of you before we start. So Dr. Ramani is a uro-oncological and robotic surgeon based in Mumbai and practices primarily in Mumbai and Dubai. Dr. Ramani was the joint director of uro-oncology and robotic surgery in the Department of Urology at the University of Minnesota, USA for five years. He was also the uro-oncological fellowship director and has successfully performed more than 5,000 uh, procedures. Uh, Dr. Ramani is one of the best uro -oncological, uh, oncologists in Mumbai and has experience of over 20 years in this field. Uh, he has published over 100 papers in, in international journals and has contributed book chapters in three urology textbooks. Dr. Ramani has also won the best paper award twice at the annual American Urological Society meeting. By education, Dr. Ramani has completed his robotic surgery fellowship from IRCAD France. He was a fellow member in Euro Oncology at the Cleveland Clinical Foundation and a fellow in robotic surgery at IRCAD in Hospital France. Sir, thank you so much for taking your valuable time out and joining us. Now, without further ado, I would like to hand over the call to Mr. Rakshid Ranjan, who, who all you know is one of the founding members at Marcellus. Rakshid, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ramani. Uh, thanks for joining thank us. Uh, thank you. And my, uh, my introduction sounded like a PMS pitch there. Well, it's it's so powerful. It has to sound <laughs> like that. <laughs> no, thank I'm you sure. again. <laughs> thank you again, Dr. Ramani. Uh, let me just set the context here, both for uh, Dr. Ramani herself as well as for our uh, for our audience. Uh, uh, so very quickly, uh, Marcellus is uh, uh, is an investment management firm um, uh, managing. Uh, Money on behalf of uh, uh, more than uh, more than nine and a half, ten thousand uh, uh, client accounts. Uh, the investments of our clients are in equities. Um, some of these equities um, are also uh, global listed companies. Uh, typically, uh, what we look for is uh, companies which have already created very high quality dominant uh, franchises that are very cash generative and the business models are such that their competition uh, cannot, uh, uh, cannot break into uh, the, 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 the sort of defense of these uh, companies as businesses and hence the cash generation continues. Um, now, uh, the audience here is, um, um, is, is sort of investors, some of whom might be our clients, others uh, uh, might be prospects or they might be just followers of Marcellus. The reason why we do these uh, uh, webinars, Dr. Ramani, particularly just to help you set the context, is uh, uh, we we like it uh, if, uh, if 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 our clients, if our prospects, they're aware of the kind of uh, philosophy that we practice, the kind of businesses that we invest in, the kind of themes that are underlying all of our portfolios, and when it comes to global compounders, uh, one of the investable themes in the global compounders portfolio. Uh, which are in the Mandal and uh, JB said he the manage. Uh, one of the themes is uh, modern utilities. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, some of our readers might have seen uh, one of our recent newsletters on this subject. Now, uh, just to set the context around the subject of utilities, uh, by definition, utilities provide essential um, essential services uh, uh, to 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 sort of uh, mass audience. Um, large scale of audience, and these essential services, in the traditional sense, have been um, have been the likes of, say, electricity, water, um, transportation, catering, so on and so forth, uh, which effectively uh, uh, effectively are uh, 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 sort of serving our daily needs. Um, and uh, uh, many of these utilities, they uh, they have distinct characteristics. Um, uh, such as massive scale advantages, uh, customer lock-in, which is very difficult to break into, 
um, and hence the monopolistic control on the customer um, and recurring revenue streams, given that these are day-to-day -day essentials. Now, these are the traditional utilities, typically the electricity, water, transportation, etc. Um, the challenge with some of the traditional utilities is that they have limited growth opportunities because either they are fully penetrated or companies that are built on traditional utilities have uh, limited uh, cash generation prospects because these might be very regulated. They might not have pricing power because the government controls pricing. Um, the, the value add to the customer might be commoditized so on and so forth. Um, so that's the challenge with traditional utilities. But having said that, uh, in our global portfolio, we actually have a lot of exposure to modern utilities, um, which are day-to-day -day essentials, but not uh, 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 areas where the dominant firms don't have pricing power. These are actually areas where the dominant firm has a lot of pricing power. These are underpenetrated categories that are on the way to become uh, um, uh, uh, sort of reasonably penetrated in the next uh, one, two, three decades. Some of the examples uh, include, uh, say, uh, for instance, the Microsoft Azure, um, uh, surgical robots, which is a subject of discussion here. And in that regard, um, uh, uh, we, 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 we are really glad that we've got Dr. Amani here uh, in this session, because when it comes to uh, Robotic assisted surgery, it is one of those uh, rare themes um, which we believe have transformed itself from being being a, being a sort of discretionary surgery option to, to a mainstream, uh, mainstream essential surgery option. And particularly for the doctors, it has turned into a must have rather than a good to have option and gradually more and more uh, surgeons uh, uh, will fall into the category of transitioning from good to have to must have when it comes to robotic uh, robotic assisted surgery. Um, not to mention uh, the profound benefits of uh, of robotic assisted surgery uh, for the patients are, um, are 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 really 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 good. And in order to understand how uh, this domain offers a great uh, investable theme uh, uh, in in the shape of modern utilities. Uh, to, to our investors in the Global Compounders portfolio. Um, uh, we, we invited Dr. Ramani. Um, so Dr. Ramani, um, it'll be great if you, can, uh, if you can just start the session with uh, some uh, uh, sort of context around what really uh, is uh, soft tissue surgery versus hard tissue surgery. How does the robotic assisted aspect uh, help uh, doctors, help patients, um, uh, what are the various options, open, lab, uh, which are substitutes to robotic perhaps, and how, how, uh, how the robotic surgery uh, plays into the future of serving essential, essential services uh, uh, to, to patients and doctors. Um, that will be a great starting point. Super, super. So thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is, um, let me start by saying that you know, I'll tell you, this is such a fabulous time uh, to be a surgeon. Uh, I'll tell you, in the last 15, 20 years, uh, the scenario has changed dynamically and where we are today. We could not have imagined in our wildest dreams 20 years back uh, that this is where we'd be uh, 20 years down the line. So, uh, talking about the surgical robots, this idea was actually initially floated in the late 1980s by the U.S. government. Uh, they were trying to figure out that on the front lines of battlefields, rather than send doctors to tend to injured soldiers, they were figuring out if there were ways to remote control surgeries. That's how the whole concept came in and they, they sort of played around. And then eventually, well, there was a company called Intuitive Surgicals, which is based out of Sunnyvale in California. And they actually came out with the first robot. And this was around the late 90s, very late 90s, when the first uh, edition of the robot came out then. Of course, it was vastly different than what we use today. But the basic concept was that the for the first time in the history of surgery, the surgeon and the patient were separated. Traditionally, when if you think about surgery, if I'm operating on somebody, you would obviously think that I'm standing right next to the patient and I'm operating. So this was the very first time in history the idea came that the surgeon does not necessarily have to be right next to the patient. 
and so the concept was that the surgeon would be far inland away from the battle and uh, uh, this would the, allow the surgeon who safe far inland to operate on an injured soldier who's on the front lines without having to evacuate the soldier back so it was like a remote operating system now the closest analogy which i can give you all of how a robot works and i think it's a beautiful analogy i give it to every single patient every single day and they understand right away if you've ever driven by the side of a road and you've seen road construction going on and uh, you've seen there is a machine called the jcb so it's essentially nothing but a glorified arm which is digging the road and if you see at the top of this arm there is a small glass cabin and there is a guy sitting inside the cabin working the levers i can't even begin to tell you principally how similar robotic surgery is so that's exactly what robotic surgery is so in robotic surgery there are two components there is the surgeon component and there is the patient component and these two are connected by cables so the patient component has instruments attached to it it actually looks like a large octopus and it has four arms and uh, each of these four arms uh, instruments can be attached depending on what i want so i can maybe one arm can have a scissor the other arm can have a grasper and these can be interchanged during surgery by my assistant and i am sitting on the console what is the console the console actually looks like a sort of race car it like you took a race car you sawed it in half and the front half of it is is what the surgeon console looks like so i sit inside it and the whole windscreen shows me the insides of the patient magnified 10 times in high definition in three dimension i don't have to wear glasses the screen shows me everything in three dimension and magnified 10 times and inside the console sort of below the screen there are two sort of gloves so i put my hand in the gloves both my hands and whatever movements i make inside with the gloves are replicated in the surgical arm now there is multiple controls available where let's say you know i have tremors i have tremors maybe i have had a lot to drink the previous night and i'm my hands are trembling uh the tremors are not transmitted to the robotic arm the robotic arm is sturdy as hell and also there is scaling which means that if i move my hand 5 cm the robotic arm moves only 1 cm so the scaling allows for absolutely fine precision work now the beauty is if i traditionally if i wanted to say take a prostate out from someone i would have had to take a knife in my hand and i would have had to cut the belly open put my hands in operate and remove the prostate now this i remember 20 years back when i used to do this uh, these used to be easily 3 3 and a half hour surgery our average blood loss then in spite of my experience our average blood loss was about 5 600 cc which means every patient got at least a unit of blood transfusion these patients would be in significant discomfort for the next 2 3 4 days and then eventually they'd be discharged from the hospital in about 10 to 12 days now comes the robot where in robotic surgery there is no knife on my table there is no knife so what we do is we use these needles which are very sharp needles and with these needles we make punctures the punctures are about 4 mm in diameter the very small punctures so we make about 5 or 6 punctures on the belly these robotic arms go in through these punctures so it obviates the need to, for us to make a cut see our our uh, end goal is to reach inside so what the robot allows us to do it allows us to reach inside without cutting you open the surgery of course remains exactly the same it's not that surgically we are doing anything different it's just that access inside the abdomen is not through a cut now it's through small holes where we are looking and we are operating uh the coming to coming to india no india has been a unique so so the blood loss the blood loss is not uh, there is zero blood loss so if wow. you, if you look at the radical prostatectomy today on an average it takes us about 45 minutes to do the surgery there is absolutely zero blood loss i assure you in the last 16 17 years i don't think i've transfused a single patient and i do this every day wow. right uh it just so everything is so magnified that you know even small blood vessels appear large so we are by instinct we are forced to clip them before cutting them and these small wow. blood vessels we can't even see them during open surgery 
so there is literally zero blood loss the patient's hemoglobin level is exactly the same before and after surgery it takes about 45 minutes to do the same evening the very same evening patients are walking about in their room i have yet to see someone who's either crying or screaming nobody the average hospital stay is about 4 days which means the fifth morning these patients go home and within about 2 weeks the younger patients are back to work the older patients take about 3 weeks to get back to work oh. so all this has come about because of advances in access to the organ we know like i have to cut you open vision no matter how good my vision is but if i'm seeing the damn thing 10 times magnified in high definition and three dimension uh there is very little chance of an error so today at least at institutions which are recognized institutions worldwide we deal with uro oncological diseases open surgery has died out there is no open surgery in fact we recently i was invited to give a talk at our national conference very interesting topic you know the current graduates who are graduating from the urology programs all across india at least those centers which have the robot they are graduating not knowing how to do open surgery which is a problem it's a problem so we actually had a session at one of our conferences to discuss how, what can we do we can't do open surgeries because then it's not fair to the patient but then our graduates who knows where they end up they may end up in a city or a town which doesn't have a robot how are they going to then manage because they've never done an open surgery in the residency so it sort of drives home the point i'm making and yet even today in a place like india there is a place for open surgery because if you go to smaller towns and cities where hospitals cannot afford to buy a robot then of course these and these patients cannot afford to travel to metros to get robotic surgery done then there is of course a place for open and laparoscopic surgery uh if you look at the current robotic spectrum which is available today uh the main producer of the robot is this uh, company called intuitive surgicals they they are pretty much the sole distributor of robots for the whole world they are absolutely the whole world there's nobody else and they're smart people what they've done they have not patented the robot they're very smart they have patented 680 individual pieces of the robot wow any new yeah yeah they're damn smart and any new company who wants to make a robot has to get around the technology or i think there's some 20 year waiting period beyond which they can use the technology so which is why today intuitive surgicals has exploded because think about it every single robot in the world is produced and sold by intuitive surgicals these guys are on another planet wow and these are the also, da vinci robots. da vinci da vinci is the trade name given to the robot right. so all the robots are da vinci now da vinci every few years a new generation comes out so for example the current generation of da vinci robots the ones which we use uh, they have been given the designation xi the one before that was an si the one before that was an x and so it's like an iphone honestly every few years they come out and they make some very minor modifications and they market it as a new generation robot honestly i think in the last three robots i don't think there's been much it's like an iphone 12 13 and 14 you know uh but these guys make sure every the, the other thing these guys are very smart at is uh, you know the instruments which we use to attach to the robotic arms the scissors the graspers the cautery so on and so forth they have made a software so that these instruments have a total of 10 lives now once you click an instrument on that's one life so if you click it on whether you use it you don't use it is immaterial once you click it on so accidentally if you have a junior assistant if you say hey click on the scissor and he is absent minded he picks up something else and he clicks it on and i'll say hey what have you clicked on i need a scissor you know oh, i'm so sorry sir let me change it but that one life of that instrument is gone because gone. you clicked it on and so the moment 10 lives are over the instrument refuses to work hey, it it doesn't work it, the the on the screen you get an alarm saying that right instrument life expired change instrument so they oh. also make sure that uh, uh, we are forced to buy new instruments every 10 cases <laughs> these guys also are smart because as you can imagine it's a very complicated piece of machinery and i am as a surgeon if mid surgery something goes wrong if the machine freezes or something i have no clue how to how to manage that so by definition 
every single case i do every single day there is an engineer from intuitive who sits in the theater is there in case you know one of the arms freezes or the robot freezes or the some odd message which comes onto the screen error or something so he's there so these guys have built in an annual maintenance contract which is about 1 cr per year so the average robot today depending on which model you buy uh the x which is about two generations old it works just as fine is available for about 12 crores wow oh. and the xi which is state of the art iphone 14 absolutely is iphone 14 the latest i'm not sure i think yes, it is, it is. Uh, so so it's the iphone 14 of robots that's about 18 crores so that is a problem that is a problem now the problem is that uh, the intuitive guys have absolutely no competition so they are in no mood to reduce prices and the buzz around our circuit for the last 10 years is are new robot is going to come then then the prices will drop but that's not happened so far so the prices are holding steady uh, which is again a big hurdle for the smaller hospitals uh, to buy an 18 crore robot is virtually impossible but uh, i can tell you uh, there is anything within the abdomen today anything within the abdomen liver colon kidney prostate any any surgeries on any of the organs within the abdomen uh, in ideal circumstances it only has to be done robotically today the outcome differences are day and night between robotic and open surgery so unless you happen to live in a smaller town and you know you're really not affording you can't travel that's a different scenario but in the ideal setting uh, i don't think open surgery has a place anymore great so is it like the patients you know they are asking when they are coming to you they right. are willing to i mean they are asking for a robotic surgery or you guys are so i must tell you something them. very interesting this is so i used to live and practice in the us for many years and this was luckily i happened to be there at the cusp when open was changed into robotic so i remember very clearly the first couple of years these intuitive surgical guys they were trying to market the robot in the us market the initial mistake they made was they approached surgeons and they tried to pitch the surgeons saying that look this is good for your patient why don't you try using it and start using the robot for your patients and all that and you know surgeons are notoriously animals of habit they're very difficult to change they, you know once they get into a certain habit it's very difficult for surgeons to change so it was virtually impossible for intuitive to convince surgeons uh, to start using the robot this i'm talking about in 2003 2004 then some wise guy in intuitive hit upon an idea he said screw the surgeons let's approach the people and then suddenly everywhere billboards appeared on the television ads appeared radio jingles appeared telling people ask your surgeon is if robotic surgery is right for you and within no time people the patient started pushing their surgeons that i want robotic surgery and surgeons are absolutely no option but to adapt and it it sort of took off from there so something similar has not happened in india for 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 whatever reason the intuitive guys have not marketed themselves at all in india i don't know why it's probably because they don't see that bigger market in india or i'm not sure why so it is mainly surgeon driven in india which means it's the surgeons who try to convince also like you all in our field also a lot of it is is branding it's how we brand ourselves so at least for the last 15 years i have branded myself as a robotic surgeon so by default anybody who comes to me is looking for a robotic surgery which is why they've come to me but very very few patients actually come uh naive naive means they have, they just know what the disease they have they have no clue about the treatment option and then they'll say doc whatever you think best we are happy to go with that so those are very few today's patients are extremely educated before they come and meet me they've already done the google search they've done you know tons of reading uh so they know what they want when they come and meet me got it so i mean you already mentioned that open has very limited scope right in the modern world if if it is not cost prohibitive but what about lap uh, laparoscopy is that something that is you know gradually kind of losing its shine or it is it is so uh, laparoscopy was a jump from open so it was all open till around the late 
93 1994 uh, then laparoscopy became the poster child and then for the next 7 8 years it was all laparoscopic the problem with laparoscopy there are two three places where robotic scores heavily over over laparoscopic so for a moment if you leave the cost out of it purely talking uh, from the medical point of view uh, one in laparoscopy the when i am doing a laparoscopic procedure i am standing right to the, next to the patient and i am holding the instruments in my hands and doing a laparoscopic surgery is an intense amount of effort on our shoulders because throughout the surgery my shoulders are like this we are operating and so if you are doing say two three cases a day that's practically impossible to do at the end of one case you are exhausted second if you think about it laparoscopic instruments are straight they are not jointed they can't have a joint in between because i am introducing the instrument through a hole in the belly so i have to work with a straight instrument now come to the robot robotic instruments at the tip have a wrist so the tip of the robotic instrument can move in any direction i want which makes surgery so much more easier and simpler and when i'm doing these surgeries i'm actually sitting down and i'm i'm having a cup of coffee right next to me because i'm not scrubbed in so i don't have to be sterile i'm my phone is right there my coffee is right there i'm sitting and i'm operating so the fatigue factor is not there the view in laparoscopy is a two dimensional view the view in robotics is a three dimensional view so intuitively when you are working in a closed space if your vision is three dimensional you're far better off than if it's a two dimensional vision so eventually once robotics picked up and it was as i told you it was patient driven it was very patient driven because surgeons were very hesitant to move from open lab to robotics they were very hesitant but patients drove it patients asked for it patients pretty much forced surgeons to get robotic done and then that's how it evolved so today also uh, as i said there is a place for laparoscopic surgery in second and third tier towns where but again the learning curve for laparoscopic surgery is very high it's not everyone's cup of tea on an average a surgeon needs at least 50 to 100 cases even to get comfortable doing it laparoscopically so it's not like you know you have your first patient you start doing it and you are a master it doesn't work that way so learning curve for laparoscopy is very high robotic learning curve is about 10 cases 12 cases it's much easier to learn robotics so all of my residents my trainees who are who come every year to us uh, we can clearly see that you know these guys have never seen a robot before but five seven cases later they're flying they're absolutely flying and when we were training people in laparoscopy we could see that even 20 30 cases down these guys were struggling so it's far easier to to adapt to a robot than it is to laparoscopy one question uh, in continuation to that but is there any kind of a risk related to robotic surgery vis-a-vis -vis laparoscopy or open that the standard risk which exists with every surgery exists so that risk depends upon the skill and the experience of the surgeon right i can show you so many complications in a robotic surgery does it mean the robot was bad or the robot was at fault no it was the surgeon maybe a new surgeon maybe someone who's trying it out initially in initial first 10 15 cases so there are complications but then who gets blamed people when they talk they say are robotic surgery kiya or complication ho gaya right if if i if i drive a plane today and i crash the plane it's not the plane's fault it's my fault i am not a good pilot so the chance of complications honestly doesn't so if it's the same surgeon who does open laparoscopic and robotic the chance of complication is equal in all three however the ease of doing surgery and the vision is far superior in robotic but honestly i don't think complication rates are vastly different understood thank you so uh, dr ramani what would be the sort of criteria uh, which uh, which drive selection of robotic surgery that you know i'm assuming there are types of surgeries where robotics are recommended there are types of surgeries where they're not recommended absolutely so, absolutely you're spot on sir you're absolutely spot on so it's not a one size fit all type of a picture where 
patient cannot come and say mujhe robotic surgery chahiye if he clearly is not a candidate so depending so i'll give you a classic example so you understand what i'm saying let's let's talk about kidney tumors it sort of will help me explain to you what i'm saying so let's say someone has a tumor in their right kidney and mm-hmm. i have to remove this kidney now i'll tell you within the confines of the abdomen as long as the tumor is about say 7 8 cm there is still a lot of space so robotically we still have place to play around maneuver around and remove the kidney robotically now once the tumor size crosses say 12 13 cm it fills up the whole abdomen so there's no place for the robot to work in now this patient even if he demands robotic surgery we can't do robotic surgery so this we have to explain to these patients that look your disease demands an open surgery so for this patient i'll do an open surgery so choosing your patient based on your own experience is vital to eventually patient going home safely see the one non negotiable end point is patient has to go home safe and sound mm-hmm. how you do it is secondary how, whether you do it open you do it laparoscopic you do it robotic is a very secondary issue our our primary non negotiable end point is patient has to go home safe and sound at any cost whatever it takes now based on my experience if i am a new robotic surgeon and i haven't done too many cases and a patient comes to me with say a 9 cm kidney tumor some other robotic surgeon who's probably done 5000 surgeries will just knock it out in 30 minutes but for me i've done if i've done maybe five cases robotically a 9 cm ta- cm is a, is a daunting task so in my hand this patient is far better off getting open surgery hmm. and is it that so you mentioned that within the abdomen for most things robotic surgery is viable barring edge cases right is that true for other forms of surgery as well yeah yeah so the prime users if you look at the statistics of hospital usage of the robot the number one users are urologists us mm-hmm. i would say probably 40 50% of the cases are done by urologists because the main the main organ which we use the robot for today is prostate the prostate is a very deep organ it's situated very deep in the pelvis so mm-hmm. it's a poster textbook poster child for robotic surgery right so probably 40 50% of the cases are used by urologists 30% are used by gynecologists hmm. today most gynecological surgeries should be done robotically absolutely again gynec is ideally suited because the uterus being a slightly deeper organ in the pelvis the ovaries and the uterus if these have to be removed or if any work has to be done on them robotic surgery is absolutely ideal so between gynec and urologists we take up a large chunk of the pie the third are colorectal surgeons so you know they do a lot of colonic work so if you have to remove part of the colon for colon cancer they are mm-hmm. third on the list fourth is hepatobiliary they are fourth so liver surgeries pancreas surgeries uh but but it's mainly driven by the urologists and the gynecologists and within each of these adoption rates would basically be driven by whether the robots are available and affordable rather than the absolutely else. absolutely absolutely and has this increased over time like if you dial back the clock 10 years was it still so mainly i i knew someone would ask me that question so i had actually reached out to the company guys to give me some statistics i'm just going to pull it up yeah here we go so as of today this i'm reading this is directly from the intuitive surgical guys who are friends of mine but uh, this is directly come from them about half an hour back so as of today in india there are about 110 robots functioning working 110 all over mm-hmm. pan india in 2018 there were 65 mm-hmm. so 19 so about 5 years mm-hmm. so in 5 years from 65 it's gone to 110 globally they have more than 8000 robots working mm-hmm. robots uh there's something which says q on q installations are 25% i don't know what that means uh annual procedures in india as on november 2022 
is about 22,000, which means on an average about 22,000 robotic procedures are done in India every year. This is as of last year, November. Globally, uh, so far, totally, globally, 10 million and counting. So these are the statistics uh... I have. So in India, then there is a long way to to go. Absolutely, two thousand is is not yeah. a big uh, big number. Yeah, yeah. But as as I said, uh, the two bottlenecks for robotic proliferation. One is of course the availability of the robot, the cost and uh, financial uh, sort of considerations for a hospital to buy a robot. But the second is also the availability of trained surgeons. A robot is not just a scissor where anybody can pick it up and start cutting. Robot requires a lot of training, intense training to be comfortable and you know not not sort of uh, have complications. So the other part of the equation is that every single year now, a lot of new doctors are being churned out who are robotically trained. So I, I can tell you that maybe 10 years from now, the mm -hmm. available number of robotically trained, see when we were training, there was no robot. Mm -hmm. So that lag was there. And robots have only come into play in India maybe in the last 10, 12 years. So it's now the current generation of doctors who are being trained robotically. So look forward 10 years, you're going to have a bunch of these guys who are robotically trained. The other bottleneck is the price. And so we are hopeful that uh, now the patent is expiring. I believe the patent was for about 20 years. So they're, they're almost there. And there's a whole bunch of companies which, which have a robot ready hmm. for it to launch. So we, we know for a fact that in the next two to three years, there's a bunch of, and I'm talking about India, I'm talking about India. There's about two, three companies, the robot is ready, they're just waiting for it to launch. So I, have, I have no doubts that in the next two, three years, there'll be some competition to Intuitive, uh, which will uh, for sure force them to rethink their price points. The, the, the other side of that is Intuitive robots of Obviously, 25 years of history, no question. India approval, all kinds of regulations. The right. regulators have gone over it. How comfortable would you be trying out a new robot? I'm not. So that's a great point. But I'll tell you something very interesting. I, I'm, I'm going to answer your question exactly. So uh, there is one robot which is manufactured by a company called CMS. I don't know the full form, but it's the CMS company. And uh, somehow they've launched their robot. And in Bombay, uh, one of the smaller nursing homes in Bombay in Chembur, uh, they've actually placed this robot. The beauty is that they market it as a robot. Hmm. So the patient gets robotic surgery. But the patient doesn't know what robot. And you are absolutely right. 25 years ahead, intuitive robots, the technical levels are too far ahead of any of these robots, right? And yet, the patient, on as far as the paper is concerned and as far as the patient is concerned, if you ask him, what did you get done? He'll say, huh, I got a robotic surgery done. So there are very few patients who are astute enough to ask, will you be using the Da Vinci robot? Most patients are happy as long as they know that they're getting robotic surgery. Now, to answer your question, even specifically, there is no question that none of these newer generation robots, the finesse levels are nowhere close. And yet, they get the job done. It's not maybe as nice as the intuitive surgicals. For the surgeon also, doing the surgery is far more difficult with these robots because the vision is nowhere as clear. The movement of the instrument is nowhere as smooth. But end of the day, somehow they get it done. So it's a gray area. It is a gray area. So these surgeons and these robots would be better than, say, laparoscopy, but they yeah, wouldn't yeah, really yeah, yeah, be. Of course. Correct. Mm. Absolutely. Spot on. Right. And um, sort of building on top of that, there is the. In a way, cost is the reason their adoption rates are as low as they are, right? So Correct. would the availability of these sorts of robots solve that? That suddenly so most, smaller towns, smaller hospitals? Yeah, find yeah, I think it would. I'm pretty sure it would. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, I have 
sort of studied the mindset of the hospital management guys over the years and end of the day they honestly the only point they care about hmm. is number of footfalls in the hospital so whatever it takes to increase the footfalls right and so they might i have no doubt that once more of these robots become available they would choose to get these robots and then market themselves as a robotic hospital and i'll tell you the percentage of patients who would actually figure out that it's not a da vinci are very few and robots in general do they like how much do they increase the efficiency of a surgeon that same number I, of surgeries that are possible or uh, so uh, that's a tough one to answer but so from the fatigue wise i can tell you if i when i was doing these laparoscopically Mm-hmm. I do one, and I would really not keep a second case on that day. I tell my office not to book a second case. Uh, today, on an average, I do three a day, and I'll tell you at the end of the third case also, I'm bouncing around. Means I'm mm-hmm. I'm ready for whatever is thrown my way. So yes, fatigue factor wise, it's it's there, but more than that, I I think it's not even that. I think the finesse, the vision, the vision. See, surgery is all about vision. The better we see, the better we clean up. and the less is the chance of injuring something we don't want to injure so the view difference in laparoscopy and robotic is totally different but laparoscopy is like a television it's like mm-hmm. looking at a tv it's a two dimensional view there's no depth perception whereas in robot it's a 3d view there's a proper depth perception so that i think is very difficult to compare uh mm-hmm. so uh, what if something goes wrong uh, when you are doing the robotic surgery something goes right. wrong with the robot for example yeah so uh, you know so that I'm, is why we have that engineer that so uh, as i said so thankfully these guys have really figured out their software and their hardware by now uh, so at least in the last 16 years it has never happened that the robot has stopped working it's honestly never happened so they have inbuilt sensors where any part which is not absolutely perfect it starts giving signals on my screen you know the the windshield it has multiple signals on it so it starts flashing that there might be something wrong with the right arm so the engineer is sitting there so then the engineer looks at it and he says okay finish of this case but then let's not do another case let me change this part and then you do the second case so but honestly i'm just being honest i, I that never happened that never happened These guys have a solid machine. Got it. Great. Um, yeah. So probably towards the end of the time, but uh, Ria, do you, uh, you know, do you have any question uh, in the queue? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So before I just jump in, there are two, three interesting questions in the chat box. But one thing I would like to ask you, sir, regarding the cost factor, like. Um, what do you think what is with respect to open surgeries and robotic surgery how difference is in terms of the cost so i'll give an example let's say let's talk let's talk specifically let's not be vague uh, let's talk about prostate cancer say somebody needs a prostate out now uh, there's multi dimensional layers to costing because uh, in a hospital if you as you guys probably know in a hospital there are room categories so obviously for every room category also there is a jump in the price but let's not compare apples and oranges let's pick a room category also so we've picked a surgery a radical prostatectomy we've picked a room category let's say single room so in a single room if i do a radical prostatectomy open the cost would be around 3 lakh give or take this is a total cost the same patient if i do it robotically it's about 6 lakhs 5 and a half 6 lakhs so what the hospital does it charges the patient for two three things one it charges the patient a fixed fee for use of the robot because they have invested 12 14 crores in the robot so they have to recover that so there is a fixed fee for every patient they pay for the robot like for example i know in one of the hospitals which i work at it's 50000 so 50000 is what the patient pays for using the robot that's how the hospital recovers the money for the robot second the hospital charges for the instruments now on an average we need three instruments per surgery so radical prostatectomy i need three instruments 
so each instrument is charged individually so in this hospital in a single room say say each instrument would be roughly around 25000 so 75000 would be the cost of the three instruments 50000 is the cost for the robot so that's about 125 for the robotic instruments and then the rest of the charges are standard the theater charge the nursing Got charge Got it. And uh, what about the insurance factors? So, uh, like yeah, both that's in another, Indian context and in Western yeah, context. Yeah. So I'll tell you. Uh, uh, in India, a lot of companies hesitate to cover robotic surgeries, and those who do, they don't reimburse the full amount. They don't sanction for cashless, and you know, thirty percent, forty percent is reimbursed back. But I can tell you, I can see a change in the last two, three years now, because what has happened is a lot of patients who have high cover, you know, they have covers of two crores and three crores, and these are affording well-to-do people. And if they choose to get a robotic surgery done, which is the standard of care worldwide, then how can the insurance company say that we won't cover you for robotic? We will cover you for open. It's like saying you want to buy a television today. but my insurance company is saying they will only cover a black and white television now i don't even know if there is a store which sells black and white television so a so lot you're seeing of a change in the behavior especially 100% 100% i can tell you so many patients have sued companies and uh, saying that right. if our surgeon is recommending robotic surgery and which is also the gold standard worldwide then who are you to say that you cannot get robotic surgery done so it's changing it's really changing because the lawsuits are piling up against these insurance companies so it will change but as of now very very few insurance companies cover it if it is robotic so it is it is a problem yes it is a problem got it so those were the questions from my side so there are a couple of questions in the chat box we quickly take those One question, Mr. Neera Shah is asking: Are there different robots of different organ surgeries, or the robot stays the same and just no, the correct. instruments change? Correct. So within the abdomen, within the belly, the robot is the same. So if your surgery is happening inside the belly, whether it is the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, kidney, intestines, prostate, the robot is exactly the same. Now, when you want to do robotic surgery on joints. especially say knee joint or the hip joint that's a totally different type of robot so the orthopedic robot is a very very different type and the orthopedic robot is more of a aiming robot it doesn't actually cut anything it doesn't actually do anything but it aims for the surgeon it will aim the knife so if a surgeon wants to cut directly on and reach a certain point inside a joint then the robot maps out the joint and tells the surgeon where to cut so the cut lands straight where they want it to land so that it's more of a navigation system so those robots are totally different but within the abdomen it's the single it's the same robot it's absolutely the same robot okay one question gentleman is asking have you used products from surgical science from sweden especially on the simulation side and how do you compare that with current intuitive operating i i'm just going to be honest i haven't So I, okay. I don't want to say something I'm not sure of. Sure. So the cost part is being answered. Uh, how often do you provide feedback to Intuitive Surgical for product improvements, and does and do it they take the so, feedback seriously? It, no, no. It is. It is. You. It's not up to you. So these guys are damn smart. The machine, the the robotic machines have inbuilt data collection systems. So every movement I make. with my instrument is recorded and uploaded to their headquarters and so usually once a year what i can do is i can actually log on to their website and i can see if i'm improving as a surgeon because based on the number of movements i make for every surgery based on how much time i'm taking based on how many instruments i'm changing the computer can actually calculate if as a surgeon i'm improving or i'm deteriorating and if i'm deteriorating then they actually point out that between these two points you are hesitating a lot you might want to look at that step again so it's an ongoing process so the so every time i sit on the robot every morning when i sit on the robot i have to log on it's a proper screen 
so i have a password i put the password in and i have to log on telling it what surgery i'm doing and real time data is being recorded and uploaded to the uh, uh, main server in in sunnyvale great so from my side i'll just take two last question which is there in the chat box one um, i mean you can answer it if you want to can't the government really play an active role in terms of providing additional underwriting to medical insurance to boost this robotic surgery well, one well, ideally in the ideal world yeah yeah and the last is uh, have pg courses in india already started including robotic surgery yeah yeah of course of course there is so so most most hospitals which have the robot also by default they tend to have teaching programs because usually the large hospitals buy robots and usually large hospitals also have teaching programs where postgraduate teaching programs are conducted and these are three year university courses so all of these residents in the surgical field they graduate doing and learning robotic surgery great so almost all the questions in the chat box also have been answered so arindam jayvi rakshit any specific points which you want to maybe uh, an ending note uh no i mean we we learned a lot so thank you for your time um yeah this truly you know kind of eye opener because we we have invested in the stock of intuitive surgical so you kind of you know uh you kind of showed us you know uh, some ways to think about it um but yeah no thank you for your time and as i mentioned in the beginning you know please feel feel, feel free to stay back we'll just do our regular kind of you know part of the uh, presentation super. now super Super. Um, thank so you for having me guys thank you for thank having you. me thank you thank you thank you so much for time sir thank See you, you. Yep. thank you i'll bring them over to you okay i'll just uh, share my presentation uh can you see my screen now mm, i can't see it yet no yeah we we can see the screen yeah, now we can see now we can see yeah. okay great uh, so i mean uh, rakshit kind of touched on it uh, so basically you know the distinction between the traditional utilities and the modern utilities the traditional utilities are two very beautiful thing you know uh, that they have solid moat kind of a regional monopoly think about the electricity gas etc at the same time they had the customer lock in so you know once you like you start paying your electricity bill you really don't care actually who is uh, providing you those right now the challenges uh, you know the weaknesses like they're pretty much regulated and the growth is constrained because you know uh, you're kind of saturated in terms of growth opportunities those are the challenges but the modern day utilities i mean we are talking to dr ramani just uh, you know a couple of minutes back so uh, we try to understand you know like various products or services which which can be viewed as utility it can be utility for certain specific group of people so for example if you think about intuitive surgical this is kind of a utility for the surgeons right the soft tissue surgeons who who are operating uh, so for them it kind of uh, provide you the services like utility to them and um, as you discussed the opportunity is huge uh, literally huge i mean think about it the country like india which uh, you know 1.5 billion people we just have 110 systems installed whereas in the us it is probably close to 5000 and uh, now you can do your math the growth growth opportunity is huge now um, if we just put this aspects in a numbers uh, what you can see here is that we you know we have listed you know in our portfolio we have few companies which we categorize them as modern utilities uh, intuitive surgical is definitely one of those and microsoft uh, microsoft is another one uh, and what you have tried to do here is that you know compare them their numbers versus the best in class american utilities so american water works very well run utility uh and again next trade energy again very well loved they are on the renewable side of it so basically on the right side of the esg you know the environmental social governance the theme that everyone talked about climate change etc if you compare the growth rate of an intuitive surgical or a microsoft versus you know a next trade or american water works there the difference is kind of pretty pronounced right 
And that is what exactly we are talking about here, that the modern utilities gives you the characteristics, the good characteristics of the traditional utilities of customer lock-in, recurring cash flow. At the same time, you don't hit the limit soon. Um, Again, we spoke about intuitive. I'll just uh, give you an idea. Dr. Ramani kind of told uh, told us about, you know, where the idea came from. Again, 1980s, 1990s, uh, that's when intuitive kind of thought about this kind of robots. As they came, came into the market, uh, you know, one of the first things that they did is kind of, you know, going to the different kind of medical schools and, you know, uh, keeping, the, because basically making the public aware that, this is some kind of concept that is available to people, which is actually much better for the patients. So when that happened, you know, the exceptional product quality, the exceptional product that Intuitive built, that also started to develop some trust. And again, quoting Dr. <laughs> Dr. Ramani, that, you know, the, the surgeons are, you know, the inertia is very high to move from one kind of thing to another kind of thing. So, once the trust was built, you know, people wanted to use these robots. The doctors wanted to use that robots, right? So that built a kind of complete network around this kind of technology. And what Intuitive did is that, uh, you know, they kept on exploring more and more. So they started with, you know, the most success, the first successful one was like urological surgeries for them. But eventually they, you know, kind of opened up various other forms of surgery like bariatric, gynecology, et cetera, et cetera. So they never stopped, right? And think about it, you get one robot that can do actually a lot of stuff, more and more stuff as days progressed or years progressed over time. So your lock-in with these machines kind of kept on increasing. And at the same time, I mean, if you if you, if you hear the webinar, you will we'll find that it actually solves quite few big problems for any surgeon, right? You don't have to stand up. You don't have to, you know, make your shoulders work for this kind of surgery. So what it in turn makes it that, you know, the surgeons are happy. They are more productive when they are more productive, you know, so they're basically, their career span is elongated to some extent. So that kind of builds a significant lock-in and this, this effect is kind of the vicious cycle that continues. And what Intuitive did uh, as a good capital allocator, that they kind of, continuously collected the data from every procedure that, that the doctor is performing, that in turn kind of tells them what next, what the technology is going next, right? Um, and as a result, what you see here is that, you know, um, it's basically a kind of monopoly to some extent, 80 to 90% market share. And we, you know, as we are discussing, there are some place some ages in some some kind of you know new competitors coming up in the ages of robotic surgery but you know in our view if that is true if that is true then actually the adoption of robotic surgery would increase and eventually look for every good hospital every good surgeon the end goal is to own an intuitive surgery machine or operate using an intuitive surgery machine. So if there are, you know, some development in the ages, right, that can help build the adoption, that is actually, we believe that, you know, it will eventually, it will eventually end up to intuitive surgical. Now, if you just look at the numbers, very consistent 15% kind of kegger. We have some blips around COVID time because at that point of time, hospitals are not open. They are only open for vaccination. Uh, so that kind of tapered down the growth, but it is a kind of momentary thing. So we're kind of in a cusp of higher growth for Intuitive. And similarly, in 2014, there was another bleep when uh, there was some renegotiation that was going on with uh, American insur insurance companies. ACA was implemented, you know, Affordable Care Act. So that shows some bleep in the 10-year number. But broadly, broadly, this is a 15-year Kegar company. Now, the ROIC is, you know, close to 25%, and that has been there for a long, long time. And the beautiful thing about this company is the top, the, uh, the bottom left chart that you can see here, the share of recurring revenue. So uh, as we are discussing, you know, with Dr. Ramani that for every surgery that you perform, you need consumables or the kind of, you know, the instruments that you cannot use after, after a certain point of time. And at the same time, you also have these technicians sitting with you, right? And kind of guiding you if there is any procedure, if there is kind of challenges that are coming up during the procedure. And for that, you have to pay intuitive. They, they cost around one or 1.2 crores for each of these contracts. So almost 15 years back, 
the robots itself represented around you know 55% of their total revenue but now they represent only 20% of it so basically they took this classic you know simple machine driven like a simple model to a razor blade model razor blade is like you buy the razor one time and then you have to keep buying the blade right so the classic gillette model that you can you can recon um now uh Again, uh, it is part of the GCP portfolio. Uh, just to give you a bit background, uh, broadly, we kind of classify our portfolio in three broad groups. The largest pool is Pick and Shovel. Utility is the second largest that we are talking about. And the third largest pool is uh, consumption. Uh, the numbers, the 2022 numbers, uh, annual numbers came through, uh, and there's not much of bleep in the longer term, you know, growth kegger or the ROICs, they're still, you know, around 19% EPS kegger. The ROICs are also fairly attractive at 2021%. Um, point being, you know, we are kind of on track on what we promised when we started this product. We are kind of targeting a six to nine percent of gross alpha over S&P 500's long-term return, um, and that is largely on track, I would say. Uh, we have uh, shown this thing before as well. Uh, so the longer term fundamental performance of the portfolio companies, again, are more than twice that of S&P 500. And as of now, the results that you have got so far, it doesn't look like, uh, you know, uh, that is going to change soon. Uh, this is again, uh, the performance till end of June. The red, uh, the red line is basically S&P 500's net total return. That includes the dividend and uh, GCP is the uh, is the blue line. Um, again, uh, short term performance, eight, nine months. I will not read, read much into it, but so far uh, the portfolio's uh, outperformance has been kind of in, in line with what we expected when we started. So Ria, uh, I'll stop here. Uh, if you can see uh, if, if you have any questions in the queue, we can yeah. take those. So quickly, one question in line with intuitive, because that's that's what the topic was today. So Arindam, intuitive surgical is a good, I mean, it's a great company, but it is trading at almost 48, 50 times the valuation. So, uh, I mean, is it not highly priced? What's your view on that? What's the growth prospect? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's a great question. And uh, I, I forgot to go through it, actually. Uh, so thanks for bringing that back. Uh, so 48 times normalized P. Yes, you're right. So uh, what we try to do here is that we try to compare, you know, the valuation vis-a-vis -vis the uh, S&P 500's valuation, where they stand. So S&P 500's price to free cash flow is around 24 times now. So it is kind of double where S&P 500 is. Now, the simple math we can do around is that uh, how much of excess growth. So we have already mentioned that, you know, S&P over a long period of time gives you a 9 to 10 percent of return. Now, if you just want to calculate that, you know, how much excess growth Intuitive has to deliver on top of that 9 percent to justify this valuation. And if you do the math, the number comes around uh, 15 years of 5 percent or 5 percent kind of excess total fundamental compounding. Now, you know, we spoke about the opportunity set here. So think about it that 5% of total surgeries are done through robots in the present day world, the modern world, right? Uh, in general, the number of surgeries across the globe is growing at around 4 to 5% clip. Now, if the robotic surgery adoption grows from that 5% to say 20%, that is basically a 4X, right? If that is a 4x over 15 years, you're kind of talking about, you know, easily a 15, 16% kegger. That is not a hard ask. Now, will it be 20% or will it be 40%? We think that over longer term, that is going to be the case. The 40% is going to be the best case. If that is the case, we are actually not paying that much. Uh, having said that, I mean, of course, uh, we would have loved that more if you get at a 25, but, uh, you know, 25 times P, but that doesn't really happen in real world. Uh, so yeah, we are happy with uh, you know where where we have got intuitive. Great, thanks. And uh, maybe last question to Arindam and JB from my end would be: um, See, uh, I mean, since we are talking about utility out here, so what do you think? Where does cloud play a role in utility, right? And what are your 
maybe you can just highlight that where does microsoft that also being a part of the utility space in our uh, portfolio company uh, where does that stand because a lot of times people get confused between you know uh, utility and why cloud and what are the various forms of cloud say software etc so what are, what is your take on it and what do you feel about microsoft as a whole so i'll end that question there and then maybe i'll just brief all of you on the way that the global portfolio can be taken and then we'll end the webinar over to jayveer and arindam uh, thanks for that, Ria. So, um, the public cloud. So, when here in the utilities context, when we talk about cloud computing, we're basically talking about public cloud companies. So, public cloud companies are um, people like uh, Amazon, AWS, Microsoft, Azure, or Google Cloud. Now, what these companies uh, started off doing and here aws was the first one so what they started off doing was they would rent effectively storage and compute capacity to um, to other companies right so what that allowed say if you're a non-it company who's developing some bit of software for internal use you dial back the clock to the early 2000s or, the, or even say 2007 8 9 you and you were trying to run something for your own people, you would effectively buy a server, put it in in an installation somewhere, uh, install something on that server, and your employees would be using that. So what uh, AWS allowed people to do was, instead of buying a server, you would rent a server. The advantage of renting versus buying was that you didn't have to add capacity uh, in, uh, clips instead of saying adding one server then adding another server then adding a third server in blocks instead as your number of employees kept growing organically the amount of capacity that you would rent could be increased in much smaller increments now this when you look at it from the starting point it was simply a ease of use and cost decision but once somebody has moved to the cloud where they're not really doing things on their own servers. They're doing them on AWS or on, on Microsoft Azure. Then going back is impossible. It, you've moved all your data to a cloud. You have uh, effectively built all your applications, everything that you're doing. For example, if somebody, some of you have, have logged into, uh, into this webinar from, um, from a Windows machine and you're using Office 365, You've got things sitting on uh, uh, on a cloud drive there. And moving that data off is is quite painful. And when you're thinking of this from an uh, enterprise perspective, where you've got dozens of servers worth of data sitting on a on a cloud provider, taking it all back is incredibly difficult and incredibly expensive. So moving to the cloud was a cost decision, but once you're there, you're locked in and that lock-in is why we think of these as as utilities now the reason cloud has grown the way they have is that one thing these cloud providers have been very good at doing is um, because they're the biggest data center builders in the world data center runners in the world they have incredible economies of scale in buying equipment and in building data centers and in running data centers now, all of these economies of scale, they pass on to their customers. Right? Uh, because they keep passing it on to their customers, their customers, an Amazon AWS customer between uh, 2007 to now, has seen a few dozen price cuts. Because each one of those scale benefits has been passed on to, at least in part two, end customers. And that has meant that cloud adoption is has kept growing and will keep growing over the next decade or two. And every bit of technological change that happens increases that sort of the need for that adoption further. A recent example would be something like AI. Right? If uh, you want to build, say, an AI model, you have two options. Either you spend a few billion dollars building your own data center or you rent a data center from one of the cloud providers. You put all your data there. You use their equipment to train your model. So 
every such incremental change in technology basically means that more and more enterprises end up going to cloud providers and now within this is the the basics of it within cloud there's a lot of jargon as with all things in tech there's a lot of jargon so we'll uh, we'll stay away from most of that um, and coming to to microsoft particularly so microsoft was actually late to the cloud um, they were roughly 3 or 4 years behind amazon aws but the advantage that they had was and that advantage holds true today is that they already had very deep sales relationships with large enterprises particularly non tech companies love microsoft products and non tech companies would be using windows they would be using microsoft office smaller tech companies tend to use google workspace tend to use apple products a bit more but traditional uh, non tech companies always use microsoft products and they've been doing it for decades because they've been doing all sorts of microsoft products for decades when it came became time for them to think about moving to the cloud microsoft was the default partner to go with it's uh, if it's a 20 year relationship you're not just suddenly going to start a new one uh, for the next uh, next thing that you want to do sure sure thank you thank you jb rarindam uh, to all the audience uh, so this is our global compounders portfolio uh, please write to us for any queries doubts to invest at uh, marcelus.in and just for all of your information and we as we spoke last time the global portfolio is open for subscription for both resident individual and for nri clients for further details please write to us on investmarcelus.in and we will revert to all your queries we'll get in touch with you thank you thank you so much for joining the webinar have a lovely weekend thank you so much bye thank, thank you, you.